So let me begin today's program and we start off by welcoming all of you. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you here today. We have a fantastic guest talking about a really, really great topic. And I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Now, I'd like to introduce two things right now. Uh, first, I want to remind you that this is a session in our special series, The Paradigm Conversations. And we're doing this in partnership with the excellent Paradigm Project. You can see some of the folks uh, already with us from that, like uh, the awesome Todd. Um, and the Paradigm Project is a, is a whole way to reconceptualize, rethink, reform, revise higher education along lines of equity and improvement for the student experience and a lot more. Now, the Paradigm Conversations is a partnership between that excellent group and the Future Trends Forum, where we're trying to have some of the Paradigm Conversations here. And we had one a few weeks ago with a few excellent guests. And now today we have a still another guest and she's coming to us with a particular angle. Uh, Mary Dana Hinton is a university president right now, and she has written a wonderful book from Johns Hopkins University Press. And you can find a copy of that book. If you look at the bottom left of the screen, you'll see a kind of tan colored box that's leading from the margins. Click that, that'll take you to the publisher's page. And what she's written about and what she's lived is the experience of trying to influence, shape, and lead an academic institution when you come from marginalized positions when you're not like me, a white cisgender male, but in fact, coming from multiple avenues of marginalization. It's a powerful book. Uh, she's a superb writer and just a wonderful person to talk to. So without any further ado, let me bring President Hinton up on stage. And good afternoon. Good afternoon, Brian. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being with us today. How are you, Brian? Oh, I'm great. Am, am, I, am I even better to see you? It's good uh, to see you, my friend. And I see so many colleagues out in the audience, several of whom you've named, like Phil and Todd, and of course, Greg, uh, someone from Holland, whose name I see is Susan Shortrid. It's good to see you, Susan. But I would be remiss if I didn't say hello to Sigrid Johnson, who is in our audience. And Sigrid and I go back a decade now to my time at the College of St. Benedict. And it was great to see uh, you. It is great uh, to see you, Sigrid. Oh, excellent, excellent. Well, here, first of all, let me just quickly uh, even up the screen a bit so people can Thank see. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they ask, where are you coming from? Is this your presidential office right now? This is my presidential office at Holland University. I'm actually only 45 minutes down the road from the University of Lynchburg. It is know. a chilly but beautiful day here in southwest of Virginia. And I'm just so honored that so many people would make time to be together this afternoon. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time, which is the greatest gift you can give us. It really can be. Um, well, I, I have so many questions, uh, and I want to commend you for the for the excellent book, which I find very moving and also really, really practical. Um, Thank you. And I, I, I guess, well, one question I want to ask, and this is a question that we ask every guest in the program, okay. is what are you going to be working on for the next year? <laughs> into, into March 2025. What are, what are the topics that are going to be top of mind for you? And, and what are the projects that you're going to be working on the most? Yeah. So I have three answers to that question. I have um, a couple of professional answers and then one personal answer. So the professional answers are the Holland University strategic plan. I mean, that oh, I'm a president. Thanks. My job is stewarding the mission and vision of the institution and moving the institution forward. So we have a strategic plan um, called Transforming Learning, Transforming Lives, the Lavavi Oculo Strategic Plan. So I'm certainly working on that with an incredible team of colleagues and uh, leaders here on campus adjacent to that. So this is still my first thing as a huge comprehensive campaign. So I am out fundraising for the campaign to support the strategic plan. And that's just yeah. Well, I have turned this into a verb now that's just presidenting on a Thursday. And so I will be doing that. Um, the second thing that's sort of walking the line between professional and personal is I'm working on the next book. And so um, I had the great fortune of doing the Phi Beta Kappa lectures at Mercer University a couple of weeks ago. And as the one of the lectures is called From the Margins to the Heart. 
Um, and so I'm working on writing a book about leading from the heart, which is tentatively mm. titled Where Love Leads. Mm. Um, and because I do think, and perhaps we'll get into this today, I think that one of the great gifts of the margins is a willingness to share your heart with others and a real openness to receive the hearts of others. And I think that has incredible implications for leadership. So the second personal professional thing is, is working on this next book. And then the third thing is personal. And I just decided on this at approximately 2.09 PM. Um, but I want to enjoy life over the next year. And I don't know that we often give ourselves permission or prioritize our own joy in the ways that we might tell students to, in the ways that we might tell one another to. I don't know that we take that in for ourselves. Um, I sent a message out to our community today. We have 23 and a half more class days before the semester ends. And I've asked them to share back with me 23 and a half think, joyful things that we should do in community. So those mm -hmm. things are coming in and I want to extend that not to just 23 and a half days, but what does it mean to lead a life of service, a life of purpose, a life of love, but also a life of joy, which is so countercultural right now. And mm -hmm. I think it will be hard, but that's the third thing I'll be working on. Wow. Wow. Um, you, you, you're, you're sending my mind spinning in all kinds of different directions. <laughs> Uh, I love um, watching your mind work, Brian. It is a, it is a delight. I love it. <laughs> well, um, I, I would. I, I really think I, I and many people here could use that new book of yours um, uh, very much. Um, and uh, I, I admire you asking uh, uh, Hollins about uh, joy, which is a great thing to do. Um, well, let, let me let me ask you a couple of questions about about leading from the margins, just to get things going. Yeah. And friends, if you're new to the forum, uh, I'm just going to ask a couple of basic questions just to kick things off. But the forum is about you. It's about your questions and your thoughts. So as uh, President uh, Hitman speaks, as she responds to my fumbling questions, please think of what you are interested in, what you'd like to react to. And again, think about the bottom of the screen, the chat box, but especially the raised hand and the question mark so that you can put your questions to us. Uh, the first question I have is, thinking so much of this book is autobiographical it's talking about your your experience and um and the lessons that you've learned in being able to be successful coming from at least three backgrounds of marginalization being a woman being black and coming up from being rural poor uh, which is which is exceptional given how much of american academia is led by people who are of course uh, white uh, wealthy uh, and and uh male mm -hmm. and and i'm what are some of the main lessons you take away uh, from all of this experience and this reflection on how to make this work, how mm -hmm. to be able to become a major leader in academia? Mm -hmm. in, again, you don't look like me, minus the beard. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a great question. And I actually have to just take one moment, Brian, if it's okay, and thank Please. Greg Britton for believing in this story enough Absolutely. to put it out into the universe. Um, and Greg believed in this story before COVID when I was supposed to get him a manuscript and oh. after oh. COVID or during COVID when I switched presidencies and he has been oh, steadfast wow. in his support. So I just want to acknowledge that. And, and I have to start with that one because it, it, he's, he certainly deserves that gratitude but he also made me put more me into the book than I normally would mm. have put into it. Um, oh, and yeah. that was really helpful, Brian. Um, he, he really pushed me on sharing more of myself and my story than I initially had. So I, I wanna say that because what it takes, and I write about this, um, it takes a willingness to put yourself out there in the universe, which makes you vulnerable. Um, it makes you vulnerable to criticism. It makes you vulnerable to um, those who look at you and don't want you to be successful. It just makes you vulnerable. And I had to really had, have had to really wrestle with that throughout my entire life. Am I willing to make myself vulnerable in order to be a leader, which I was going to have to do. And what I mean by that is 
when I walk into a room, people make a set of assumptions about who I am, what I believe. Um, at, a, at a negative extreme, but a real one, people make assumptions about my competence, about my intelligence. And I spent a lot of my life trying to be impervious to that, trying to be just like them so that they wouldn't question who I am. And that wasn't working. And I realized what I need to bring into every room is who I authentically am. And I have to believe that who I am, who you are, who Greg is, who Secret is, that we all have value that we bring into that space. In my case, because I'm a woman from the margins, I had to overcome a lot of narrative in my mind about my value or lack thereof. And I hope that by sharing that in the book, it encourages other people to own and embrace their value. Brian, that's not to say that it's not um, that it's not difficult. That's not to say that I don't have moments of doubt or question. I think that's being human. But what I hope came through the book was that if you take the time to think about your journey, to reflect on the strengths you naturally bring with you, the margins become a place of nourishment, a place of hope, and for mm. me, a place of joy. And no one can take that away from me. Um, I tell people all the time, I'm the leader I am, not despite the margins, but because of the margins. And so my, any success, you use the word success, any success I have, it's because I'm a black woman who grew up in the rural South in poverty. I own that, I'm proud of that, and I embrace it. And I believe there are strengths that come from that, um, that support leadership. Mm, what a beautiful answer. Oh, thank you. You're in very the, kind, Brian. Uh, well, in, in the chat, by the way, there's a, a greeting from one M. Palencia, who says, fun fact, I'm an alum from the College of St. Ben's. Oh, hi. Oh, M. I know I have to look. Oh, there you are. Oh, hello. How are you? Sorry. It's good to no. see you. No need to apologize. M is one of mine. <laughs> but you're talking about joy. Um, yeah. and, and also the forum is about connection. So we, we, we love to be able to make that. If, if I could, if I could press you on that last point, uh, when, we, when we think of marginalized populations in the United States, we think about populations that are disadvantaged along multi, in many, many ways. Uh, you mentioned, for example, being judged negatively by your appearance when you enter a room. Mm -hmm. uh, we could think about how black Americans tend to have much less wealth than uh, white or Asian Americans. Uh, we could think as well about uh, women being underrepresented in leadership positions in, in the academy. Um, and of course, poverty by definition, uh, especially rural poverty, means you know, just having fewer resources and being secluded away from networks. How do you, how do you draw on those marginalities? What is the, the hidden strength of those positions that powers you um, into what you do? Yeah. Part of it, Brian, to be honest with you, is sheer and utter defiance. Um, and I, I often say people find it hard to imagine me defiant. And I took off my gold sequin jacket I had on earlier today because I thought no Whoa. one would take me seriously with that on. Wow. But part of it is defiance. And I say defiance because I was tired of people telling me that because I was a Black woman from the South, that I was not a leader and I was not going to be successful. I just, I reached a point where I just couldn't hear it anymore. I was tired of hearing people tell students who look like me that they had somehow engineered their failure when really it's our institutions that are failing our students. The reason for the Paradigm Project work is it's to change institutions and infrastructure and belief systems about our students. And so this book in part came out of my own rejection of this notion that somehow mm -hmm. because I'm a black woman, I am less than, and that there are strengths that I believe come from being in the margins. Um, for example, I said to a group the other day that when you are poor and you have a young family learning how to, to feed them and to house them and to clothe them is a masterclass in strategic planning. I'm really good at strategic mm -hmm. planning. And part of that is because I, for me, strategic planning was life or death at some points. And so I learned how to do that. And that is a skill set that I bring to me. I was taught like so many um, young black kids are taught, and this may be true in other 
communities of color as well, but that your education comes first because no one can take away your education. I was just at a talk with our Roanoke City Public Schools and her mother told her the same thing. So when I hear this talk about, well, you know, education doesn't have value and kids today are questioning the value of an education, I'm willing to bet those aren't kids from the margins like me, right? Like hmm. families know that college matters. They know that that's the way you're going to pull yourself out of poverty. They know that that's the way that you're going to make a difference in the world. So I heard that my whole life. Um, being from the margins is where I first heard about service, that uh, you have to give something back in the world. It's not just about you. It's something bigger than you. The Benedictines um, talk about the value of community, the dignity and all work. And that's a lesson that resonated so much with me because growing up, I was told no matter what you do, you have to do it in service of the community around you. You have to work for the common good. You have to make sure that there's dignity in whatever you do. So this accumulation of lessons from various corners of my life really came together, if you will. And this leadership theory that we bring something to the table. We bring something powerful and unique and inspiring and meaningful to the table. And mm. it's okay to make oneself vulnerable and say, I have something that I bring. And yes, there are slings and arrows. But even more than that, I look at students who call my name across the campus and run up to me for a hug. I had a student come by my office earlier today and who just needed a hug. She just needed to be told it's okay to be upset. And I can do that because I'm not held to the standard of a leader's hands off, a leader doesn't, you know, doesn't connect with students. I get to define leadership for myself. And I would hope other emerging leaders, particularly emerging leaders from the margins, can find, um, can find some strength and comfort and encouragement in that. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. I mean, First of all, it says so much about you as a president um, that students know you. Oh, and gosh. They, feel they, can, they can come up to you. I mean, that's, that's a, that automatically um, uh, makes you an unusual president and a fun one. Uh, uh, this, is, this, is, this is very powerful. And again, my, my wheels are spinning. Let me ask one more question. Okay. Um, how, how can all of academia, um, people of, of all backgrounds, how can we best support and uplift uh, people in academia who are marginalized, again, along multiple, multiple dimensions? Um, yeah. what, what can we do better to make sure that we all benefit? Yeah. You know, a couple of things immediately come to mind, which is one, you have to know the people around you and be in relationship with them. I no longer think I can look at someone and tell whether or not they come from the margins or whether or not they want to be an ally to someone from the margins. In, all, in order for me to, to think about that, I have to get to know them. And I think that's part of what we've lost in higher education. You said that not a lot of presidents know their students. I feel like that's the one thing we should be able to do. And, and I know at big institutions, it's, it's probably impossible, but man, if I don't know my students, at least in broad strokes, I have the fortune of knowing them by name, but if I don't know my students, what am I doing? Why am I here? So I feel like that's something that we have to do with each other. We have to get away from these monoliths of the faculty and the administration and these students and recognize that there are beating hearts of human beings that have been entrusted to us as leaders. And that if you are a leader, you're going to hold that heart so gently in your hand. And you're going to think about what's best for that heart before you think about what's best for the institution. And that's hard. And that's not what we're taught. I didn't learn that in new president school. I learned that from a decade of being a college president. I have a note. Um, I'm looking at my desk, which has glass on it. And over here is a little note that I wrote to myself a few years ago. And it says, investing in people is investing in hope and to me when you invest in people and you invest in hope you're investing in education and you're investing in the future and so if you want to be an ally to those in the margins or if you're from the margins yourself my first sort of word of advice is to seek to be in relationship with one another i used to always say that you know 
being a leader is not about being the loudest person in the room. It's not about being the person with the most power or the largest voice or even the smartest person in the room. Being as a leader is about being the one person in the room willing to be in relationship with every other person in the room, even when you don't want to be. If you're a leader, you're mm. committing to being in that relationship with people. And I think that that's something that I learned in the margins. A lot of people didn't want to be in relationship with me. There are people today who don't want to be in relationship with me, but I will choose to be in relationship with them because they're human beings and I believe that they have intrinsic value. And that's not always easy. Um, well, probably I should change the name of this next piece I'm working on from where love leads to love is hard because it is hard at times, but I think it's the only thing that's going to save us at this point. Mm, I, I, I don't know if you've, if you've seen this, but in, in, the, in the chat box, people are pulling quotes from you. And, oh. and uh, <laughs> investing in people is investing in hope, I think just I, I feel like inscribing that on the forum's webpage right now. Um, and, and your your sense of leadership being that relational connection, I think, is, is so vital. But friends, let me stop talking. Uh, my job here is to put all of you in relationship with our guest. What would you like to ask, Professor? Uh, sorry, President uh, Hinton, to give her a precise title. Uh, what would you like to learn more about her leadership style, or about her book, or about her experience? And again, please you know, use the uh, the question mark um, or the raised hand button. You can join us on the stage. It's clear that you don't have to have a beard to be on the stage. You do have to have a lot of hair, though. That's important. Um, and uh, or we're just, ecumenical. Uh, the the those without hair are welcome, and we we need you to balance this out a little bit. Quite right. Quite right. Quite right. We, we need an absolutely bald person next, just to just to get something down. Um, and uh, again, click the question mark uh, if you want to type in uh, your your Q and A. Um, we have um, and while people are doing that, while people are thinking. Um, you know, you can see smoke coming out of your ears. Um, <laughs> the, let me um, ask a, a, another question um, from a different angle. Um, it seems like we live in two different worlds when it comes to technology and education. Mm -hmm. uh, on the one hand, or in one world, we have people who see technology as connecting. Uh, that's why we call it social media. That's why we have tools like this. Um, that we use it to learn more about people and to expand our knowledge and expand our experience. Uh, on the other hand, we have the, or the other world, is the view that technology is alienating, that it's separating, uh, that it removes us from each other, uh, that it, it in some way reduces the human experience. Mm -hmm. um, and, I'm, and these two worlds have been struggling for decades now in education. Um, and as we try to connect people to each other through all kinds of technologies, um, I'm, I'm curious right now, what do you, what's your vision of technology in, in the university? Can it help that kind of heart-based leadership uh, or does it separate us? Do we, how, how can we use technology to fulfill that kind of dream that you just described? Yeah. So I just need to let the audience or participants in on a secret, which is that I told Brian, I, I can't manage the chat box while we're on this call because I'm not very good at it. So you're going to need to put me in Camp Luddite um, in terms of technology. That said, I actually I don't think we want to set this up as a binary when it comes to technology. I think um, it's a tool. And I think when it's a tool, that is deployed appropriately, it has tremendous benefit. How else would I have gotten to see Sigrid today? I mean, I opened my screen and there she was. How else would that have happened if I if we didn't have technology? So that is that is absolute joy there. On the other hand, I, I tend to think more, um, for reasons I'll explain shortly, I tend to lean away from technology than more than most people. I want to acknowledge that up front in part because I have seen now for a decade the really devastating effects of certain technologies on women. Um, and as someone who is leading a, another women's college, um, I personally chose to step away from social media. So you'll find me on LinkedIn. I don't know how to use it well. So if you want to email me, email me directly because I'm not great on LinkedIn. I think I still have an Insta page from my first presidency. Nice. But when I look at, when I listen to my students talk about it, 
I think it's important for me, Mary Dana Hendon, to sort of provide a different option for them. I, I want to stand against that so that maybe they will decide it's okay for them to stand against it as well. That said, it is but a tool. And the question is, how do we deploy it? Can we deploy it for love? 100%. That's what you do, Brian. You deploy this tool as an act of purpose, as a response to your vocation, as a tool of gathering people together so that we can all be better. I unfortunately in this role often don't get to see that part so much as the other part. So I will just say that um, it can enhance relationship and it can destroy relationship. So I think it's less about the tool itself and more about the intent behind how you are using the tool, um, the readiness for people on the other end to, to leverage this tool. So I try to move away from is tech good or bad to more what is your intent behind the technology? Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense. Um, and I, I can just you know nudge you to say, you can write more about technology in this new book. Um, uh, <laughs> um, I, I suppose one could. Um, I'm going to talk about compassionate leadership um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. a little bit on servant leadership um, and why I think that leaders don't have to be lonely. You know, I was taught that leadership is lonely, that yeah. you yeah. that once you're at the top, it's a solo gig. And mm -hmm. one of the areas I'm really excited about is um, why well, I don't believe that's the truth. I think that's a center notion. I think it's a center notion that leadership has to be lonely, that there's only mm -hmm. room for one person. I think for someone from the margins, you realize that it takes a village. I'm not here because of what I did by myself. I'm here because of my mom who never had an education, but instilled in me a deep sense of the power of an education. I'm here because of Betty Cooper, the woman my mother cleaned for, who paid for me to get an education. I'm here because of Laurie Hetherington, who would let me come to her house when I couldn't afford to go home from college. I'm here because of Kevin Mackin, who thought I could be a leader and invested in me. So. There's a whole list of people who told me that I could be here. And why would I cut myself off from other people at this moment when I could help them become leaders too? I don't, I don't think um, leadership has to be lonely. I think when you've been in the margins and you recognize it takes a village, then you want to not be lonely with others or be lonely when you have others you can spend your time and energy with. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, that's advice I think quite a few of us can take to heart. Um, friends, the uh, the mic stands open, uh, as does the chat box. Uh, and we actually have, as, as I say this, somebody clicks the right button. And so we get to uh, we get to bring up M. Palencia. Oh, uh, yay, M. <laughs> I'm so excited. Look <laughs> out, you are unchanged. How well, are you? I have my my uh, diploma right I here. See, I signed that. I hand sign all of those. How are you, my love? I'm good. Good. Um, it's so good to see you. Funny story that. as well. Um, the St. John's president, Michael Hemesev, who yeah. was the president at of yeah. St. John's during my time is actually teaching in my current institution, Carleton oh, College. Um, so it's very, very small world. I'm so glad yeah. I get to see former presidents here. It's good to see um, you. But I do have a question. Yes. I, I wanted to say hi, but also a question. <laughs> um, so I am now in a full-time staff position. I am an academic technologist at Carleton College, mm -hmm. but I also have many other roles here at Carleton. I, I'm co-chairing um, a community resource group at Carleton. We started an initiative um, from our division of inclusion, inclusion, equity, and community. Mm -hmm. We have a strategic plan um, called Carleton 2033, and we have a list of goals to achieve in the next 10 years. And one of them are community resource groups. I am the first of that kind. I, I started that group. Um, it's called uh, Carlton Latina X um, Community Leadership, and it's for professional development um, for gender minorities under the Latina X um, community group. Yeah. And so my question to you is, 
what is your advice for someone like me who's just starting out, who is a very young professional, like freshly out of college and, and wanting to be in these leadership roles, wanting to be in acts of service, wanting to create those relationships, um, but is, has, is just starting out? Yeah, well, you have been on a leadership journey for a long time, Em. Um, you are someone whose leadership just shines forth. And so Carlton is very, very lucky to have you in their community. And I'm so glad that you're sitting at that intersection of inclusion and technology because that positions you to really have a powerful impact. You would not have volunteered for this work if you didn't have really the potential to do it well. Like you raised your hand. And so already we know that you have something in you that's beckoning you to this work. And so my first piece of advice is to sit with that. I'm going to use the word calling. I know that doesn't resonate with some, but summoning, calling, beckoning. That's okay. Hello, little baby. What compelled you? Think about what compelled you to do this work. Like, there's something that you want to see accomplished. And honestly, I would write that down somewhere as a reminder to yourself why you are choosing to do this. Because, M, you know, I'll, I'll tell you the truth about everything. There are going to be moments when it's going to be really hard. There are going to be moments when people are going to challenge you. There are going to be moments when people, when you're going to see nationally the assault on our LGBTQIA community right now is unconscionable. And at some point, that's going to be something you're going to have to face directly in your work. What I need you to know, Em, and something that I've known for a long time, is that you have not only the intellectual acumen to work through it, you have the personal and emotional acumen to work through it. Mm. Difficult things are going to come. You are going to be made vulnerable in this work, which means you're going to be opening your mind and your heart to, as I said before, the slings and arrows, but you have within you what you need to get through it. You have it. There are going to be moments though, M, when you're going to have to take a step back. So I tell my students, you know, I'm always telling students thing, M. So what I've been saying a lot over this past year is protect your heart and protect your peace. I don't mean cut yourself off from the world, but I mean, there are moments when you're going to have to draw some boundaries and say, in order for me to be whole, I have to take a step back. There are also going to be moments when you're going to say, in order for me to be faithful to who I am and to my identity, I'm going to have to speak truth to power. And in those moments, it's frightening. I, in the book, I talk about the moment when I quote unquote made it. And it was a moment when I stood up for myself. So what I keep in front of me quite often is a picture of myself when I was five years old. I call this the happiest day of my life. I remember the circumstances of this picture and I would do anything to protect that kid. So remember that you're protecting that five-year-old through the work that you're doing. You're protecting um, that five-year-old when you set boundaries. You're protecting that five-year-old when you speak out against injustice. So just remember that and know that you have it in you and know that you have a president who you can reach out to anytime. So I'm gonna put my, the one thing I think I can do is type my email address in the, uh, in the chat box and you reach out to, you reach out to your president when you need something, okay? Absolutely, thank you so I'm much. I'm so proud of you, M. Sigmund Lux Vestra. That's the motto from the College of St. Benedict, and it says, so let your light shine, and you're doing that beautifully. Yes. I'm excited. My five-year reunion is coming up this summer. Yes, yes indeed it is. Congratulations, <laughs> Em. So uh, you. Th thank you for the great question. And, and Em, please, please say hi to Professor Nathan Graw, if you can. Oh, yeah. He's, Absolutely, uh, yes. A, a great writer. Uh, he is and a, a, a really, really great friend. He was, he was a great guest on the forum, too. So yeah. please, please say hi. Indeed. Um, I will take that. If, if you're new to the forum, that's an example of a video question. So all you do is click the raised hand button. Um, now I want to share a text question from the Q&A oh. box. And before I do that, I just want to say, Mary, thank you for that moving, moving answer. Oh. How, how supportive. I. Uh, here's the, the text question from our friend in the far north, 
uh, John Hollenbeck, who's coming to us from Snow, it looks like, in Madison. And he wow. says that the institution of higher education is a technology of practice, mm. well optimized for supporting mm -hmm. the dominant culture. Can school as practiced serve the margins mm. or need a whole new market? <laughs> I tell you what, John Hollenbeck is start trying to cause trouble. I mean, I you know, yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, John, I think we, let me take a step back. Um, when I was at the College of St. Benedict, and I think M would have been a student um, at the time, we had a protest in January of 2017. And you can imagine the circumstances of January 2017. A protest was not unusual at that time. And I went to the protest. I was pretty upset too. And I didn't know presidents aren't supposed to be at the protest if they're being protested. But I went because I was, I was upset and I wanted to be with my students in this moment of grief and pain. And I've written about the fact that, it, John, as I stood at that protest, I had sort of a, a emotional collision because the very things that our students were protesting were the same things that 30 years earlier I had stood on a campus and protested more faculty of color, more support for students of color. Um, the list goes on. And as I stood there, looking back 30 years and recognizing how little had changed, it was for, in some ways a seminal moment for me because I realized a couple of things. I realized that when people say, oh, it's an issue of money, we don't have enough money, that's not true. In 30 years, we could have gotten enough money to change these systems. When people say, oh, we don't have a pipeline, mm, that's not true. It's been 30 years. Someone could have been born, gone to school, and been in the pipeline to help us move forward. What we've had for 30 years pretty consistently is a lack of will to change the structures that poorly serve those of us in the margins. And so I find myself um, really really frustrated at times with where we are today because it's not a lack of resources it's a lack of will i think oftentimes we think we can program our ways out of inequity there's not a there's not a speaker to bring to campus there's not a book to be read there's not a professional development series to be launched that's going to change higher education unless and until we're willing to look at infrastructure and think about how our model inherently works against people from the margins. For example, um, our model is one based on exclusion. When you think about um, the highest ranked colleges, part of that ranking is how many kids did you choose not to serve? Mm -hmm. I would turn that on its head, that maybe we should be valued by how many kids we choose to serve and that we serve with distinction. That would be a very different way of measuring. We're not ready to do that in higher education or we think about how few students can, or how selective can we be um, and how can we use our resources to support some students, but not all students. That's another way of exclusion. So I do think, John, that there are elements of the model we have to significantly disrupt. I had the privilege last week of being on a panel with um, someone from Bunker Hill Community College um, who Leah was talking about work that she did there where they were looking at their probation system and they were academic probation and they were wondering why black and Latino males were overrepresented and the students who were ultimately dismissed even though they weren't initially overrepresented in the numbers of students on academic probation. And I think I'm telling the story properly. If I get details wrong, please forgive me. She said she spent a little time looking at the forms they use and the language they use in those forms, like probation, appeal, really criminalized language. Like it was the language mm. of jailing. It was the language of, um, you know, what sort of appeal would you like to mount? Or it was the language of this is your one chance. It was very typical language in higher education. But when she talked about how it said to young black and brown men, this is just another part of sort of the incarceral system that we have in this country where it read that way, it turned them off from trying to be a part of this system because they're used to hearing it from a criminal justice perspective 
But in higher ed, we've adapted that language when we think about academic probation or when we think about academic appeals process. We use really harsh language that is really othering to some people. When they change the language, those numbers really re realigned um, to more sort of proportional uh, numbers. So why don't we think about the ways that our systems inherently penalize people from the margins? I never had money to pay my fall tuition until the day before classes started because I had to work all summer long to pay money. Well, that meant I got last pick of classes, right? Most of us have systems where if you have an outstanding balance, you don't get to register for your classes. So what we're saying to our poor kids is that you don't deserve the right to choose you get what's left over. I'm really proud at Hollins that we pay for study abroad for students and we give lots of, mm -hmm. of money for them to do that. I never got to study abroad because I couldn't afford it. I, I couldn't afford to go to Kitchell, North Carolina. I wasn't going to Oxford. And so we, we put these systems in place, what Buffy Smith calls the hidden curriculum of higher education, which suggests that unless you know the secrets, you don't get the full experience. I think we have to dismantle all of that, John. Um, I, I have a piece in Diverse Issues from, um, I guess maybe a year ago now, where I use Audre Lorde's quote as the opening, um, you cannot dismantle master's house using master's tools. And so that's where I've kind of landed in higher education. We cannot use the tools of exclusion to become a more inclusive enterprise. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, first of all, John, thank you for a, a typically great question. And Mary, I, I, this is being recorded, so you can just take that recording and enter that <laughs> right into Microsoft Word for your that was beautifully, beautifully spoken. You're but, very kind to say that. Thank you. Uh, in, the, in, in the chat, a couple of good comments I just wanted to bring out. One is from our dear friend, Sarah Segregorio, who says, here, here on the call out to the structural inequalities or inequities in higher education. And uh, Aiden Carter says, this part is too real about late enrollment. Uh, I think there's a there's a story there. Um, yeah. Uh, friends, we, we have 10 minutes left. So you have 10 minutes to put in your questions and your comments. So again, you can tell that we're, we're more than unusually friendly. Um, and you can use the <laughs> chat box if you're informal, use the Q&A box if you have something or join us on stage, uh, we, we'd be glad to see you. Um, Brian, I just put in a link to that article that I mentioned, I'm glad it made, I'm glad it made Greg happy. Oh, and Em, I'm putting a link into a book that we did based on the Becoming Community Project at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University that talks about community resource groups. Um, you'll remember Professor Janser, Brandon Woodard, um, Anna Mercedes and I, and a bunch of others, worked on ways that you could um, do this work. So I want to um, make sure that you have access to that book. So take a look at that in the chat as well. Oh, thank you. Look at you, multitasking. I, I'm not learning. good at it. I'm sure everyone sees my eyes spinning around as I try to go to, to another you're, website. You're flawless, you're flawless. <laughs> uh, we, we, we have a, a, another video question and okay. this is from Sean Crossland at Utah Valley University. Let me bring him up on stage. Hello, Hi, Sean. Hello. Uh, you, you requested a bald person on stage, so I thought I would uh, <laughs> Thank you, make it. <laughs> um, so, I, I, uh, for context, I run a Master's of Higher Education Leadership Program. Mm -hmm. uh, as That's you can imagine, uh, the, the politics in the, in the state of Utah are uh, uh, interesting, to say the least, uh, disheartening, uh, you know, really challenging and problematic. Um, yeah. So, so my question for you is kind of two-part, thinking about these aspiring leaders in higher education. Uh, I, have a, I have a very difficult time uh, selling them uh, presidential aspirations of any kind. Um, it, it doesn't, uh, from, from my vantage point, it doesn't seem like a, a, a thankful job and a, and a rewarding job. So I uh, would love to hear um you know some of the highlights some of the some of the nuances of, of what keeps you doing it and and any thoughts on uh how we might reinvigorate the uh the college presidency role into uh one that's more justice oriented yeah well sean let me start by saying 
I am I am really sorry about what's happening in your state and in so many other states. Um, inhumane is the word that comes to mind. And there's a part of me that I think, how are other folks so hurt and broken themselves that their joy, their priority is breaking other people, um, which is what this ultimately does. We are erasing other people and their histories. And so I just want to start by saying I see that. I do not presume that I am safe from it um, where I am or that any of us are safe from it at this moment in time. So um, how do you encourage someone to be a college president? Well, <laughs> the average college presidency is now 5.9 years, um, just so we're aware. So it's, it's a short gig if, if they don't like it. But I actually think that that, that, that worries me more than anything else. We cannot change and improve our institutions and make them more sustainable if we don't have sustained leadership in these institutions. And sustained leadership demands that you are clear about what your purpose is. If your goal is the perks of this job, if it's the title or the salary, if that's your goal, I would say, please don't be a president because it, it, <laughs> that's not going to serve your students well. To be a successful president means that you have to see, honor, and value the humanity of each person that you encounter. And I think that is so important. And I think that's why I'm starting to talk more and more about the work of the heart. Um, and academia doesn't like that. Because when I talk about the work of the heart, I'm talking about work that is less academic, less, uh, I mean, more, I'm sorry, less academic, more emotional, more institutional. Um, and that's hard for us because that means we're not basing our value on who we can exclude, but on who we can include and see clearly. And that's who I want around my presidential tables, people who are willing to welcome in others, people who are willing to honor another person, but it is, that is hard to do. It is hard to do right now. Um, but I think it's the most important thing we can do. And part of the reason why I'm talking about love as a leadership strategy is because I think much of the DEI work, and you won't hear me use the letters DEI much anymore, sure. Um, sure. but that work was really about two things. One, changing the hearts of all we encountered so they could be open to receiving the other and two honoring the hearts of those who because of their desire for belonging and inclusion were seeking to have their humanity validated we use dei as a framework for that and it's a valuable framework but i'm not going to stop the work just because i can't use the letters anymore so to me, I'm, I am trying to translate transformational inclusion to love. And maybe people will catch up to that. Maybe eventually people will say, oh, no, she's just talking about love in order to get everybody a seat at the table. Yep, that's right. But it, you'd have to be pretty bold to tell someone not to talk about love. But I will tell you, as frustrating as a day can be, Sean, I get to touch the lives of young people today, which will enable me to touch the future in ways I can't imagine, right? Is the superintendent who was just on campus was talking about this as legacy work. And that's what it is. I am Palencia as the example. It was worth a whole lot of hard work to be on this phone and see someone that I've known since they were 18 until today and to hear that M is at Carleton doing this work and impacting the lives of others, that's like being a teacher, which I think is sort of the highest praise one can get. To me, that is, that's amazing. And that's why you do the work because you want the opportunity to touch the future and change the lives of folks you'll never meet. I'm, I'm happy to, to say that. I, I may or may not be allowed in the state of Utah. I'm not sure. Um, but I think we, I would be happy to 
to record a message. I'll well, put a blue dot in front of my face. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get you here somehow. We'll get you here. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the question, Sean. Thank you. Thank you indeed, Sean. Um, and thank you, Mary, for the uh, really, really great answer. Um, and if, let, let me know if there's anything I can do with the forum to smuggle you digitally into Utah. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. We, I appreciate that. We, we can follow up. We, we have time for uh, one more question uh, from the excellent Marina Kim. Um, oh, just hi, Marina. Yay. Um, she says, how do you enable key campus stakeholders to be in relationship with each other? And mm -hmm. what are the ways that you can try to break down barriers in the hierarchies to build bonds of trust and love? Well, nothing brings me greater joy than to see Marina Kim, and it's good to see you, and thanks for being here. A big shout out to all of my PWG colleagues who made time today. Marina, um, when I was a faculty member, my first job was as a core curriculum director, my first administrative job, and I'll never forget a colleague told me that I was going to destroy higher education because I know that's a lot of power, right? I was going to destroy higher education. What made him say that? I thought it was only fair that faculty and staff sit in a room together and think about what the core curriculum should be doing. Because students don't just have a classroom experience. They have a, they have a university experience. And it's really important for everyone who impacts students to be in dialogue with one another. And mm -hmm. so, I, but that's what he said, I was gonna destroy higher education, I was absolutely heady with power at that moment. But here, that's how you do it, Marina. You break it down by bringing everyone into the conversation. So when we have conversations about our mission, our endowment, our enrollment outlook, whatever it is, everyone from the facilities team to the board of trustees are invited into that conversation. There's nothing to hide. You wanna see what the budget is? Come on in, I'm happy to share it with you. You want to see, um, and Susan can attest to this, you want to have a conversation about the mission, you want to hear about athletics, everyone is invited into that conversation because we all have responsibility to the institution. We are all responsible for some of the outcomes that the institution achieves, but most of all, we all love our students. So why not have a word together with one another? Why not believe in a shared common good why not believe in a vibrant future? So to me, the way that you make that happen is you invite everyone into the conversation and you model what it is to be a lifelong learner. So I love it. I love it when we get to learn together. Susan was in the session with the superintendent a few minutes ago. And wow. when Susan helped co-lead a session on developing a staff academy, everyone was invited to that. And why wouldn't we all be there together? We are the mission of Holland University. You and your colleagues are the mission of your school. So why don't we work together and solve these issues together? Well, that's another great, great answer. Um, thank you, Marina, for the excellent question. Indeed. Uh, Mary, I, I don't wanna rush things, but we have one more video question. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm starting to feel like this is, this is your life, you know, uh, because <laughs> this is another person that you might know. Uh, oh. And we bring her up on stage. And, uh, Aww, oh, my nice <laughs> secret. Hi, how are you? Oh, and when, I, when you popped up on my screen, I screamed out loud. How are you, my friend? Well, I am fine. Am, am I unmuted? You are. Yeah. I can hear you just fine. Um, I just wanted to say that when you came to St. Ben's, we quickly figured out this is something different here. And rather quickly, we saw you loved us. Thank you. And I've been affiliated with St. Ben's for 69 years. Yes, indeed. Since 1955. Have. And Aww. only one other time have we been loved. Aww. And that was Dr. Azurda. Who was there in the Stanley Azurda, who was president in the late 60s, early 70s, a man at our women's <laughs> college. We, the, I was a young faculty member and I realized he loved us. It was such a different experience. Mm. And now all these years later, you came and loved us again. And that is very, very powerful. I just was Thank so you. delighted to hear you Aww. articulate that in front of all these people who are going to be leaders, that Thank loving you. the people you are leading is the only way to go. 
That that is what matters, Sigrid. And it was an honor and a privilege to love everyone at the College of St. Benedict. And I still do them. It's an honor and a privilege to love all of my colleagues here at Hollins. When you but I want to just share a quote because I know we're out of time, but this is for you, Sigrid, and this is for you, Brian. Paolo Freire wrote, because love is an act of courage, not of fear. Love is a commitment to others. No matter where the oppressed are found, the act of love is commitment to their cause, the cause of liberation. So for all of us who come from the margins, our love is our liberation. Our love is our commitment to the cause. And so that's the only way I can see to lead at this moment in time. So it, I, I do love you so much, Sigrid. It is so good to see you. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Sigrid. Thank you. And uh, I hate to say it, but this we are out of time. Uh, we are. President Mary Dana Hinton, you've been a fantastic guest. Thank uh, you. Thank you for great. the opportunity, Brian. Oh, it's 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 our pleasure. What what's what's the best way for people to keep up with you? Should they? Uh, um, my email Hinton M D. So Hinton and then my initials at Hollands edu. Hinton M D at Hollands edu. Excellent. Looks like Doctor Hinton right there. That's that's brilliant. Indeed. Um, well, good luck on this next book. Everybody grab uh, her most recent book and keep Thank an eye on her. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> Look, I keep it right today. here on my desk. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, me. everyone. Indeed. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon, Mary. Thank you. Farewell. Uh, don't leave yet, friends. To be just uh, quickly point out a couple of things. If you'd like to keep a uh, conversation going, uh, you can do this on the socials, as they say. Uh, you can find me here on Twitter, Mastodon, Threads, and Blue Sky. Just use the hashtag FTTE. If you'd like to look at our previous sessions uh, about all aspects of marginalization by poverty, by race, by gender, as well as presidential leadership, you can find them in our archive at tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. If you'd like to look ahead at our next sessions, go to the forum website and you can see we have topics, including more on the conversation, the Paradigm Conversations. And my thanks very much to the great folks at the Paradigm Project uh, for helping make these possible. Uh, thank you all for your attention, for your participation, for your heart. Um, we, uh, I can't wait to do this again. Um, please take care over the next week. Be safe, be well, and then we'll see you next time online. Bye-bye. <laughs>